I'm now going to try and share with you uh, about 10 years worth of John Lewis history in about 15 minutes. So this will be uh, probably a Guinness Book of Records. Um, it started 150 years ago. Um, John Lewis uh, first established itself. And I think it'd be fair to say that in the last 10 years, the business has probably seen more change than it did in the previous 140 years. Uh, an immense rate. As we've moved from being a purely bricks and mortar based department store business through the world of multi-channel, and now into the slightly less predictable world of, of, of omnichannel. Uh, I've had the pleasure of leading the development, as Mark said, of their um, highly automated semi, uh, their, their national distribution centre in, in Milton Keynes, uh, down in Buckinghamshire, a bit further down south in the UK, um, since it was first conceived around about 10 years ago. And uh, more of that to come. A uh, little brief bit of background. Before that, I managed to survive four quite interesting years with Sainsbury, um, the big supermarket business in the UK, when they introduced a uh, high level, auto, uh, level of automation in the, uh, in the UK. That was quite an interesting time, not for the faint-hearted. And before that, I actually did look after the, uh, the shop direct uh, operation that Paul referred to earlier. Um, again, a big automated solution uh, just across in, the, uh, in, in Manchester there, Shore and Oldham. So you could say that during that time, I've had the fortunate experience of seeing automation in many different guises, the good, the bad, and, uh, and the goddamned ugly. So as part of this case study, I've got three kind of areas I'd like to share with you. Um, first, the Magna Park story, because it really has been at the heart of the changes the business has seen over recent years. Secondly, I'll try and call out some of the key kind of strategic decisions uh, and ingredients that have gone into getting us to where we are today. And I'll finish with what I see as being the sort of key challenges going forward. So back in time, uh, if you will, to 2005, that's when the journey uh, really began. Um, back in 2005, the business strategy was actually entitled 10 in 10. So the, the, the clue's really in the title. This was the sole ambition to increase our department store estates by a further 10 branches in a 10-year period. Now, it had taken 140 years to establish 26 department stores. So this was quite amb ambitious back then. Now, in terms of e-commerce, during the dot-com crash uh, in the UK, we, we did actually go and buy a, uh, a web platform. Quite an interesting move, but a genius move, as it turned out. Um, we bought our web platform from buy.com, the UK arm um, of buy.com. Um, and it'd still be fair to say in 2005, our online business was still quite experimental, uh, run by a dedicated team uh, in London, it, uh, along with its own third-party fulfillment provider. So the main emphasis was 10 more department stores with a dusting of, of e-commerce on top of that, definitely not the, the key driver. So 26 stores. In terms of our distribution capability, um, it looked very different then. I don't think this does it very proud. It's, this wasn't our first two-man home delivery operation. That's not fair. Um, we had nice uniforms and all sorts of things. But it'd be fair to say our level of capability from a distribution point of view was, was very immature. And to remotely consider accessing uh, stock for customers and branch replenishment would have been deemed slightly ambitious. The network works on a kind of a five-day-a-week basis with the odd early, early finish on a Friday thrown in. In terms of store-friendly deliveries, equally, most of the replenishment effort to our department stores was pushed downstream to the, to the shops themselves. So they had the effort of unravelling these deliveries and making them shop ready. And as well as that, a key conundrum for any business trying to contemplate how to access the same pool of stock for both customer delivery and shop replenishment has this conflict with picking single selling units as opposed to bulk replenishment to the shops. And back then, uh, more than 65% of everything we were sending to the department stores were in warehouse packs of more than one. So if the shop required two units to fill the shelf and that product was sourced in a pack of 10, it received a pack of 10. It took two from the pack to fill the shelf, and the other eight products had to go and sit somewhere in the back of the shop. And this is an example, uh, many examples like this, of the uh, amount of um, over-replenishment that was happening back then that was filling the back of the shops up. So uh, I think there was a crazy statistic at the time, something like 14 weeks' worth of sales stock actually downstream from the distribution centres back then. 
And uh, against that background, the ambition was set for the business. So this was a, a list of the original design objectives we put together uh, to try and uh, to conquer the uh, to, to conquer the quest. And you can see there's a number of points there. The single pool of stock was a, a key driver. Uh, additional capacity, store-friendly deliveries, and hidden amongst that was this direct-to-customer capability as well. Absolutely not the top of the uh, uh, agenda, but a consideration. So the key milestones as we, uh, as we embark through the journey, we signed a, a contract with Canap, our automated supplier, in 2006. Uh, we started the build of the first distribution centre in 2007. Uh, and during 2007, 2008 is when the main installation of the automated uh, uh, solution started to take shape. 2008 was quite an interesting year, um, as you're probably aware, is that the recession uh, uh, took, took hold. And there was a serious consideration by the John Lewis Management Board at the time whether to actually mothball the development and come back when times were better. Now, fortunately for a number of people, me included, um, but the, uh, the business decided to continue with the venture, and uh, the rest is history, so to speak. We went live with our branch replenishment solution in 2009, and that was followed in September 2010 with the introduction of our direct-to-customer capability. Now, during that time, the sheer reality of what was happening with our online business was actually starting to take shape. This was the original forecast we were presented for our online business. So, some people said that our online business would probably never get any bigger than an average-sized department store. That would probably be quite ambitious, and never be anything like the size of our flagship store in Oxford Street. Um, what happened in reality was something quite different. Uh, our sales last year uh, reached 1.4 billion online, um, and going to be a little bit more than that this year, um, against that original forecast of 300 million. Now, I think the person that uh, came up with the first forecast now heads up our health and safety department, <laughs> just to um, <laughs> horses for courses, so to speak. So it's quite uh, slightly out with that forecast. And the result of that basically meant that every single year since the facility went live, we've looked at wholesale kind of uh, development just to kind of keep pace with that, uh, that growth online. And even, even as I speak today, there's a huge kind of expansion to the facility actually taking place. So what has the site achieved so far in terms of its original ambitions? We got to the point where we've now achieved this single pool of stock. Uh, the, 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 the facility looks after about 120,000 uh, SKU, small items, uh, and we have a single pool of stock serving all channels from that one pool on a first-come, first-served basis, be it retail, be it customer. Um, we've managed to keep ahead of the future of the capacity, which is easier when you're looking at a 300 million turnover business, because if you're 10% out with the forecast, and as you've probably seen, we're great at forecasting, um, that potentially is a few more packing stations. Being 10% out in a 1.4 billion pound operation could be catastrophic. So we have managed to keep our noses ahead in that respect, along with direct customer capability. Um, click and collect as well is obviously a, a key part of our proposition. Uh, it started in 2008. Uh, there's many debate about why the hell would a customer order online and go into a shop and collect things. Well, that's kind of nonsense. Um, it now kind of uh, looks after about close on 60% of our online offer is click and collect. So it's our jewel in the crown, but that's grown massively. And again, the facility, at the, uh, the uh, automated facility has helped the rollout of that proposition. Singles picking, so we're picking singles. Uh, we're breaking down about 90% of everything we receive into the facility into single selling units. Um, and a new venture we started a, a few years ago now, a new proposition called John Lewis at Home, much smaller, uh, only looks after a, 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 a more narrower range of product for, uh, for, for John Lewis, um, but again, very small residual stock rooms, and they, they kind of demand a sell one, pick one um, replenishment profile, so the facility has enabled the rollout of those stores as well. Um, shop family deliveries, we, we stream to over a thousand different bin group combinations for the 42, 43 department stores that we've currently got, so lots uh, less effort in the department stores. And as you'd expect from any kind of new warehouse management system and goods to man picking uh, technology, improved accuracy and improved efficiency. Um, and the big one, really, and this kind of emphasises the real uh, key uh, aspects to the development, this is a picture of our High Wickham shop. Um, High Wickham didn't do fashion at the time we went live, um, and this is that same footprint now. So we've been able to turn that non-selling space into quite lucrative selling space. And the shop sales in that particular example increased by around about 35% in its first trading year. So looking back, design objectives 
agreed, done well, not done well, we're immensely proud of that. We, we are, we're incredibly paranoid because this crazy world called Omnichannel, you never know what <laughs> madness is going to happen next that's going to bite you in the, uh, in the posterior, so to speak. So we're uh, always on the lookout for Murphy's Law kicking in, so to speak. But um, we, we're proud. And the question you'd be quite right to ask is how have we managed to do that? So what's been the, ma the magic that's enabled us to move from a strategy which is 10 more department stores with a small online growth to move into a business where more than 32%, 33% of the business is now driven by online volume? We've just had lots of luck. No, we haven't. We've had a bit more than lots of luck. This is a, tr this is a real picture taken by our neighbours. So me saying my prayers every single night for the last nine years has obviously helped. So the two buildings, there was a picture taken of a rainbow and the ends of it being both in both buildings. So something's worked for us. Um, but in terms of um, some key call-outs now, the first one was committing to firm foundations, as I call it. See, back in 2005, when we were pulling all the data together, sales forecast, et cetera, that says, how big should this facility be? What should its capability be? The theory was kind of saying, well, we probably need a 400,000 square foot uh, distribution center, and that will last us well into 2020 where instinct was telling us something completely different. If we have a shift in this strategy in some way, we could be landlocked. So the key point we did was make sure we built with capacity and scale in mind. So the first distribution centre was probably built 30% bigger than it theoretically needed to be. Um, but thank God we did that, because the, uh, the, the, you'll see as we come in. And it took us weeks and weeks to get that red mark off the roof as well. Oh, <clears throat> the next area, which is, again, a, an absolute key win for the... Um, facility is the embedded flexibility. Easier said than done, and quite rightly, automation does come under the microscope when we talk about the inflexible nature of automation. It can take anything between 18 months and two years to, to mature and actually take from conceptual stage through to reality. And in the world of Omnichannel, where anything can happen, you can get things wrong. But there's three aspects that we've uh, developed really well in the solution. The first one is the mix of automated and manual solutions. So we're not talking advanced robotics. We have a quite manually intensive, low capital outlay manual picking and packing area that we roll out for peak periods. And that's complemented by the real investment, the automation that's been sweated uh, 24 hours, seven days a week. Second area is the module nature of the design. There's probably not a component within the site that we haven't had to extend uh, over the last number of years to enable us to cope with that growth. So again, we built the facility with that, in that modular nature, uh, with that modular nature in mind. And the systems as well uh, are very multi-flexible, uh, multifunctional. So in our branch picking area, we can pick for customers. In our customer area, we can pick for branches. So we tried to develop that way. So three key aspects on that. And there's a whole case study behind each of them three. Uh, and the final bit I, I kind of uh, uh, probably relate to is there being a focused team. Having been involved in a number of quite large-scale, complex programs before, there is a tendency to pack them with consultants, project managers, people that kind of uh, take the fun out of the job, and, uh, and lots of kind of issues with like, making clear decisions. And we made a commitment right at the beginning of this quest to make sure that we have one quite empowered, dedicated team that look after the whole cycle, from business case, to pro uh, project planning, to implementing the solution, designing the functionality, testing the kit, and making sure that's rolled out into, uh, into the operation as well. Mixed with what I would see as a, a real key ingredient in John Lewis, which is our John Lewis partners. Uh, we're a co-owned business, uh, the largest co-owned business in the UK, uh, and we're blessed with a team that have probably become completely immune to the change agenda. Because every single year, bar none, without exception, we've had builders in to ch change things, build mezzanines, build things around them. Uh, and it's this team that's really enabled the uh, John Lewis Management Board to continue the quest. We added a second building to Magna Park 1 uh, last year. So the second building is joined together with uh, a large bridge link. Um, it stands at around 2.1 million square feet. And we've uh, a new automated hanging garment solution uh, being implemented in the second building. When that goes live in April next year, the, the, the consolidation of all of John Lewis's flat and hanging products will be consolidated through that building. Uh, around about 250,000 SKUs, again from a single pool of stock serving both customers and shops. So the best way of probably um, encapsulating that whole journey would be this great quote from Douglas Adams. 
uh, that we may not have gone where we intended to go, but we think we've ended up where we needed to be. That's probably the best way of encapsulating that part of the story. So that's the uh, first part of the journey out of the way. And finally, uh, in terms of uh, challenges going ahead, the three areas uh, that I believe that we have challenges with. One is economics. The second one being proposition. And the third area being events. And I'll very quickly uh, run through these. Uh, again, there's a whole case study behind every one of them. In terms of channel economics, the biggest, one of the biggest challenges we have as a business, and I would suggest within the retail sector, is the cost of online shopping. We believe it costs about three times as much to serve a customer than it does to put a product on a shelf in a department store. And with a business that's moving towards kind of 50% online, that gives us some real challenges going forward in terms of sweating the asset. The second area is proposition. And I'd like to think anybody that shared the John Lewis shopping experience in a shop, uh, we believe that's where the magic happens, that customer-facing experience. Uh, we like to think we're re really good at it, and that's what we get back from our kind of quite loyal customer base. But again, with an online business now being close on 35% of what we do, that's a difficult thing to kind of rely on because we're not meeting the customer in a lot of the cases. So say hello to the new sales assistants of our business. And these are the pickers, the people packing products, and more importantly, the handing over of the goods by the delivery driver. Again, giving us a real challenge going forward. And finally, um, events. Any, uh, any ideas of what 177 represents? And it isn't how long I've got left to speak, you'll be glad to hear. Days before Christmas. Everyone says that, and I wish it was, but it's not. I have this plastered on my wall because it's a number of days left to this bloody thing. The, um, <laughs> it's the number of days to Black Friday. Um, I relate to the, uh, I use the analogy, have we created a monster? Uh, and, and this is incredible, um, a credible thing that happened, I think, in 2012, introduced in the UK, I think, by Amazon. Thanks for that. Um, and um, it's kind of an amazing time of the year. I think two years ago, it didn't, you, you kind of noticed it on the, on the radar. Last year, crazy, all hell let loose. Uh, this was Magna Park. No, it wasn't Magna Park in 2012. <laughs> this was uh, probably a well-known shopping chain in the UK. But um, it, the day was crazy. It'd be fair to say, but Black Friday for our business uh, was huge. Um, you can see some of the stats there. £44 million taken in one day. We took £2 million during midnight uh, and 1 o'clock in the morning, and we were processing about 2.6 orders per second. Absolutely crazy, crazy day. And it'd be fair to say, we were incredibly close to running out of gas, but we didn't. And that's what we all say, isn't it? So, um, but that's the kind of challenge we've got going forward, these kind of crazy spikes we've got. It's, uh, you have to say how, um, how kind of sustainable is it to polarise all of that demand into such a short period of time. And we are, just to finish, as strong as our weakest link. No longer is this supply chain game just about pushing as much stock into the department stores and the shops and the retail estate as possible and letting them guys get on with the busy Christmas peak. It's all about the end-to-end the -end supply chain. Whether that's your web platform that can cope with the sheer traffic that's going through, the capability of the fulfillment operation, or as I see it now in the UK, probably the Achilles heel of what we got is the carrier network. So what are we doing about it, John Lewis? I can't actually tell you because it's a secret. <laughs> but I'm sure if we were to compare lists, they'd be very, very similar in terms of the opportunities to try and... I mean, if it was up to us operators, I'm sure the uh, profile of Christmas peak would be very, uh, very different. We'd probably start promoting in February, March, and uh, everything would be easy, but it's not that way. So, but lots being done and lots being looked at in that. A number of people say, suggest that John Lewis are uh, probably got their noses ahead in this crazy omni-channel stakes that we've got, which we feel incredibly privileged to, be, uh, to have such an accolade. However... We believe that the race has only just begun. We're not actually sure there's a finishing line, but the one thing we're absolutely certain about is that there are many, many more challenges ahead. Thank you. <laughs>